So there's something, I think we may have referred to it before around the Parshas Vayechi time, but it really plays into to Yom Kippur in a very powerful way. Okay, what is it? A medrash, there's a medrash Tan Chuma. The medrash is actually in Shmos, and it tells about what happened after Yaakov Avinu passed away. It says, Kivan Shev Meis Yaakov, after Yaakov Avinu died, Maksiv, what does it say in the Torah? So it says, right, Vayiru Achi Yosef Ki Meis Aviyam, they saw that Yaakov died, and they said, Lu Yistemenu Yosef, maybe Yosef is going to hate us. Vahashiv Yoshiv Lano Eskola Rasha Gamalnos, and he's going to pay us back for all the bad that we did to him. Vayetzavu Yosef Lemor, so they said to Yosef, they commanded someone to say to Yosef, Avichot Siva Lifnei Mosa Lemor, your father, meaning Yaakov Avinu, he commanded before he died the following, Kotomu Yosef, this is what you should say to Yosef. Ono, sono, pesha, achecha, v'chatosam. Please forgive, right? Bear the sin of your brothers, the pesha and the chet. Ki ro'og malucha, because they did evil to you. V'atos sono la pesha avde eloke ovicha. Right, forgive the pesha, the sin of the servants of the God of your father. V'yev ki Yosef b'dabromito. And Yosef started crying. Oh, so this is it. The Medris says, they saw, right, they had their reason to believe that Yosef, right, maybe was showing that they didn't like him. Who did they command to speak to Yosef? Bilha. And she went. Now the kicker is the end of the Medris. Amar Abi Yovin, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Atem amartem beloshon hazeh ono, you, the brothers of Yosef, you use this loshon, and you said that Yaakov Avinu said, Oh no, right, please forgive him. Osid coin Godol, the Kone is the base Kodesh HaKodoshim. On Yom Kippur, the coin Godol is going to go into the Kodesh HaKodoshim. And Melamed Sanigori Al Benechem, he's going to defend your children, meaning the children of the Shvatim. Beloshan Hazer, On Hashem, right? That's we say it again and again in the Avoda, right? He says, On Hashem, Chotu Avu Poshu, etc., On Hashem. Kaper, forgive, etc. So, as you pointed out, number one, it's hard to see the connection. And what's even more problematic is that those words were never said. Okay, Yaakov Avinu never said that. They came for the Shalom to bring peace. They came and said that Yaakov Avinu said that before he died. So, it's hard enough having that in the Torah in the first place, but now saying that that non-existent saying of Ona Hashem is so powerful that that's what we're going to, the coin Gadol uses on Yom Kippur to bring atonement for Am Yisrael. How can it be? Okay, this is, um, is an interesting way of phrasing it in the Medrash. The Medrash says, Omer Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, Gadol hu shalom, shalom, making peace is so great, shekosav HaKadosh Baruch Hu dvarim batar shlo hayu ela bishvil shalom. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote into the Torah things that only existed because of peace. Right? This is what happened here when Yaakov died and they saw this and they sent Bilo to say to Yosef and say, right, your father commanded before he died, Ume'olam lo tziva Yaakov mikol adroi me'elu klum. Yaakov even never said it. Me'atzman omru dover said. They made it up. Amr HaMashim Gamliel, HaMashim Gamliel said, Re'e kama dio mishtapech. How much ink has been poured in all of the writing all the Sifrei Torah since then, right? Kama kumusim mishtabrim. How many quills have broken as the Sofrim write those words? Kama oros avudim. How many skins were made into cloth into parchment to write those words? And the last one, kama yenukim misratzin. How many kids got patch in cheder? Right, if they didn't learn those psukim, okay, right, that they got, which is there. And he says, to learn something that never happened. Okay, so he says, that all comes to show us the great power of shalom. Okay, that it's so important to bring peace. And this is, we say, mishani mipnea shalom, sometimes to bring peace. You can veer from the truth. It's not a free-for-all. And you also have to know how to do it well if you're doing it, because if you don't, you get caught and you make things worse. Right, but this is what we have here. 
And therefore, we still have the question, how is it that those words that they used, words that they made up, are somehow the key phrase that the Kohen Gadol uses on Yom Kippur again and again, Ona Sona. So, this is the Tolner Rebbe tied this into another fascinating medrash about Yom Kippur. They say in the, it's in the Psikta Rabbasi, on the Pasuk in Tehillim, David Amel says, Le David maskil ashrei nesui pesha, sui chata'o. Fortunate is the one whose pesha, whose wrongdoing, pesha is more the intentional wrongdoing, is lifted up, sui chata'o. And his chait, which is more the less intentional, is covered up. Right? And this is also referred to in a pasuk. Nasasa ovona mecha, David Amel speaking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you bore, you raised up the sins of your nation. Kisisa kochatosam selah. You covered over all of their chet. When does this happen? He says it happens on Yom Kippur. Says, now it's interesting here that he describes the Satan coming to prosecute on Yom Kippur. Whereas other sources seem to say that one day the Satan can't really, doesn't have power, is on Yom Kippur. But I think the resolution is that his kitrug gets nullified. His prosecution gets nullified. On Yom Kippur, the Satan comes to pr- prosecute Am Yisrael. And he gives a very long, detailed list of all the sins of Am Yisrael. And he says, right? So he says, Yesh Bumas Olam There are adulterers among the nations of the world, but guess what? Chain be Yisrael. Your Jewish people also do that. Yesh Bumas Olam Ganovim. There are thieves among the nations of the world. V'chein be Yisrael, and also your children. V'akadosh Baruch Hu parit eschul yoseim shel Yisrael. Now, Akadosh Baruch Hu, he tries to speak about the merits and the good things of Am Yisrael. Mao said, so what does he do? He takes a scale and he puts the avonos on one side and the zchuyos on the other side and they come out even. They come out even. So the satan goes running off to bring some more averis to tip the scales. What does HaKadosh Baruch Hu do when the satan runs off to get those averis? He says, He notelis avonos mitoch kakaf. He takes all the Averis off from that pan of the scale. He scoops them all up. And he hides them under his robes. Right? And the Satan comes, and there's no more sins on the scale. It's all weighed down by the mitzvahs. Right? And he says, right? This is what it says in Yirmiyo. Right? That the sins of Am Yisrael are, are searched for, and they're not there. When the Satan says this, he says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in an objection, B'nai Shalom, Nasosa Avon Amecha, right? You took the sins of your nation. Kivan Shara David came, when David saw that, he started saying this parak of Tilim, Ashrei Nesui Pesha Ksui Chata. We are so fortunate that that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does for us. The question is, it doesn't seem very fair. Right? It doesn't, you know, there's Din, there's judgment, there's Rachmim, there's mercy. But there's a klal, oh, there's a klal of Ein Merachmim Badin, right? And you don't have mercy mixed into din. The din is the din. Mercy will have its place. And also a very strange chazal, which says, Kola Omer Shakurish Baruch Vatron. Whoever says that Akurish Baruch overlooks things, Yivasru B'nei Me'of. Let his intestines be overlooked. That's a very strange phrase. First of all, what does it mean the person says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu overlooks? That's the guy who's sitting on Shabbos, say, smoking away. You're not supposed to smoke on Shabbos. He blows a nice ring. He says, Elokim Gadol. God is big. He can handy, handle my cigarette. Okay, he can, it's, it's not going to bother him so much. What does it mean, Yivos Rubenei Meav? So Chaim Friedlander has a beautiful explanation of this. The intestines are the longest organ in the body. Right? They say if you would unroll the intestines, they go for quite a while. Now, if you would come over to a person and say, listen, my kid has show and tell in school tomorrow in science class, so I have a friend who's a surgeon. Would you mind if we just do a little bit of laparoscopic surgery, take out just a, a bit of your intestines? He could bring that in for show and tell. No other kid would have that. It would be very special. He's like, 
No. No, you have tons of intestine. It won't bother anything, right? Just a few inches. Like, no, get your hands off my kishkas, right? <laughs> Why? So, so the answer is, he says, we want to have all our parts. We want to be sholim. He says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when you say HaKadosh Baruch Hu can overlook, the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has din and judgment because he wants us to be whole, right? He, he, he's saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, ah, overlook this cigarette, but then something's going to be missing in your life, in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's universe, in Am Yisro. That's why we say it's the of Shlemus. So how do we have this medrash in the Psikta saying that HaKadosh Baruch Hu scoops up all the Averis of Am Yisrael, hides them, right, and then everything comes out good. So the Rambam has this famous explanation, right, in Hilchas Gerishin, that there are certain times, and again, don't, don't, don't try any of this at home, kids, without speaking to a professional, right, there are certain times in which a person is supposed to do something willingly, such as giving a get, Right? That's one thing. Or there are some other examples as well. But the person says he doesn't want to do it. So, Kofi no Rotsa'ani. Beisdin can, so to speak, hit him. Use physical, what's it called? Duress, something like that. Uh, anyway, they can, they can smack him around some until he says, I want to do it. Okay, so we ask the obvious question. Right? He doesn't want to do it. He just wants you to stop hitting him with the baseball bat. Right? What kind of that? He says, I want to do it. Why would we give that any legitimacy? So the Rambam explains that every single Jew wants to do deep inside. He wants to do the Ratzon Hashem. He wants to do what Hashem wants. He wants to do the mitzvahs. He's simply confused, and the baseball bat helps him get things clear, right? get in touch with his inner self. That's really what we're saying and it's brought down there. So therefore, right, what it comes down to is that every time we do an Avera, right, even when we do an Avera intentionally, there's one level of our essence that is never on board. Is never on board. There's uh, the, um, it's called the, the Eretz Tzvi, the Kozhik Lavarov. The Kozhik Lavarov was the Rosh Hashiv in Chachmi Lublin after Meir Shapira died. He was, he was a, a giant. He has these Shailas and Chuvos, Eretz Tzvi, and he has them. Chumash and Moadim. So I saw his explanation once on the Chazal. Chazal say that people sometimes ask, Maya Hani Lon Rabbonon. What do all these Talmidei Chacham do for us? Right? They're sitting there, right? This Sefer, that Sefer. Right? What do we get out of it, bottom line? The Gemara says, what do you get out of it? It says in the Torah, There are various for which you're supposed to get 40 lashes. And the Chachamim said, you know what that means? 39. That's what they do for you. <laughs> okay, that, that's what they do, Mazet. Explain the Kashuk Lavarov, he said like this. He says, 40, and again, it seems like if the Torah says 40, isn't 40, 40? Right, how's 40, 39? Up till 40, they explain says, because 40 would represent that the Jew did that Avera with all of his everything. He was totally in. Chazal came and they revealed a Jew is never totally in. Never. There's always a part of him that doesn't want to be doing it. And there's always part of him that wants to do the right thing. So therefore, that is the truth of who we are inside. Deep, deep in our essence, Right, he brings that the Kotzker said that in Svarim HaKadoshim it says that there are ten levels, ten spiritual levels inside of us. And he said that tenth level is one in which it's in the Kudas HaEmes, it's one in which the person simply is always aware of what he wants to do and always aware of the right things. And that is our true identity. Okay, the question is, how a person gets to it and how it comes out. But on Yom Kippur, that is what takes the forefront. So therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is able to look at us and, ter- and look at that pile of Averis that the Sutton piles up and to hide them away because the way they are now, right, the way they are truly, those things aren't really shaykh to them. They're not really connected to them. I'll tell you another way in which it disappears. 
there's, um, the Svaseva says in a few times, he brings this idea that you can get schus from things that you will do in the future. Okay? A classic example in the Torah is, Moshe Rabbeinu asked, with what schus will Am Yisrael leave Mitzrayim? Kodesh Baruch Hu tells him, Bo'tziach ha'asa'om hazeh, tavdu ne'asalokim, esa'om mi Mitzrayim, tavdu ne'asalokim ala harazeh. When you take these people out of Mitzrayim, they're going to serve me on this mountain, meaning they're going to receive the Torah. So the receiving of Torah that they're going to do is the schus that lets them come out of Mitzrayim. Okay, so he says that shows that you can draw strength from the things that you were going to do in the future. Rav Hutner quotes Rabbeinu Yonah, who says that also. He asks in the question, it says in Pirkei Yovos, Kol if a person's deeds are more than his knowledge, his knowledge will last. But if a person has more chokhmah than deeds, ain't chokhmah miskayemes. So he asks, how can a person have more deeds than chokhmah? In other words, if I know about sukkah, then I can do the mitzvah of sukkah. If I don't know the mitzvah, I can't do the mitzvah. Rabbi Yonah says what it's talking about is like this. That when a person decides, he says, you know what, I don't know all the mitzvahs in Torah, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to try to keep and to implement what I receive from the Tov Seya Torah, from those people who are the bearers and transmitters of Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives this person strength now in his journey from what he will do in the future. So that all sounds beautiful. I said, it's almost like college loans, right? In America, they'll look, you see this kid, smart kid, wants to go to college, doesn't have money. The U.S. government looks at him and says, okay, you're a smart kid, you'll go to college, you'll earn money, you'll be able to pay us back, I give you a loan. It doesn't always work out so well, though, with the U.S. government and the loans. Um, but here... This is what happens. But the question that comes to us in our head is, wait a second, but what about the Averas I'm going to do in the future? Does HaKadosh Baruch Hu punish me now for the Averas I'm going to do in the future? It would seem to be that that should be the balance of power. Right? It's that you'll get. It's like that, 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 that the true, true do now is Hashem knows what's going to happen in the future. And if he, if he says we're going to we'll do, we'll do it again later on, it doesn't help. So the Svasevis doesn't say like that. He says, he, he, he brings, that's a scary one, right? He brings it from the Zara Kodesh that, no, it doesn't affect. Why? Because the Averis you do in the future have no connection to who you are. Averis you do are who you aren't. Okay? That, that's, that's, right? A person, when he does sins, we always view it as temporary insanity. What do you mean temporary insanity? You know, have a psychiatrist examine me. I'm a totally sane person. I like this Avera. I want to do this Avera. I'm doing this Avera. But the way the Torah views the person is, no. No, you really don't. That's, that's not you. The mitzvahs you're going to do are connected to who you are now because they're an expression of your true identity. But the Averas aren't. Don the Kaf's chus is... Correct. In other words, that's viewed as a form of rachamim, right? It's viewed, but it's based on emes, right? In other words, the way, the way you look at the person, and here, even in the din itself, because that is the essence of who Am Yisrael are, and like we say, we have many levels inside of ourselves, but on our most true level, this is who and what we want to be, right? There's, there's a Hasidic parish, I forget who it was from, when Moshe Rabbeinu tells them to take, right, the Zikenim from Am Yisrael to help him out, and it says, Asher Yodato, that you know, Kehem Zikne Om Veshotrov, you know them, because Moshe Rabbeinu says, you know, you know who these people are because you live with them. With me, they come before me, wrapped up in their talis and everything, I have no idea who they are. This is Moshe Rabbeinu, right? You don't know the nature of these people, right? In the Hasidic stories I read, every, you know, minor league Rebbe knows how to be able to tell when the person comes in front of him if he's a good guy or a bad guy. So the explanation is, they said, because when the person would come before Moshe Rabbeinu, his good side would come out. Moshe Rabbeinu says, when they come to me, they're always tzaddikim, right? I need to know how they behave when they're not with me. So, so that's the idea of this true identity coming out. So now let's go back to Yosef. 
The brothers told Yosef, they had Bilha tell him, Avicha Tziva, your father commanded, Ana Sana, right? Please forgive the sins of your brothers. And that didn't happen, but it was written in the Torah. So the Malbim explains, right? I'm sorry, and, and others explain that this is, they knew Yaakov Avinu, that this is what he would want. They were able to say clearly that this is what Yaakov Avinu's Ratzon is. Kira'og Malucha, right? It says that the brothers knew that they did evil to you, but Ligmol is an interesting thing. Ligmol means to pay back. The Malbim explains that they were in a fight with you. They felt that you attacked them first. Right? Rashi brings down that they said Lashon Hara about it, him and all these things, about the brothers. Okay, so, so it's true. They were upset. They felt you were threatening them. You attacked. Ligmol means to pay back. But really, the brothers always, throughout the whole time, they did want your brotherhood. And Yaakov Avinu knew this truth about them to the extent that they could say it even though he didn't even say it. So now, right, when it comes to Yom Kippur, the Medrash says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to the Shvatim with those words that you used, Anna Sana, words that were never said by Yaakov Avinu, the Kohen Gadol is going to use those words when he comes in and says, the Vidoy on Am Yisrael. It's because the principle is the same. The principle is that we're, it's an expression of the deep truth inside of the person and who the person really is. And that's emes. That's an emes. Talmud Rebbe here explains a, a few other things with this idea. Example he brings. Heavy mit Talmidov shall Aaron, Oiv shalom v'rode shalom, right? Be the students of Aaron, Oiv is abrios and makarvan la Torah. So in the Ovis Rabbi Nosson, it explains Aaron's tactics in bringing peace, in bringing shalom. So it says, what would he do? You had two people who were fighting. They had a feud. Aaron comes to one, he sits down next to him, he says, oh, you know your friend over there? They have this feud with, you know what he's saying? He feels so bad about what he did. He's mamish, he's crying, he's saying, how can I even, you know, approach him? I would want to apologize, but I'm too ashamed because of what I did wrong. And then he goes to the other one and he says, you know what your friend is saying? He says, I feel so bad for what I did. I would ask for forgiveness. I'm too ashamed to even look him in the face. And he does this and eventually they come and they meet together and they cry and they hug and he makes shalom. So the Rebbe asks, again, the, the Dora Midbar were clever people. Right? This doesn't sound like such a, an easy tactic, you know, to hide from people. Right? Is that really true? And how many times can you do that? Right, to have it keep working. So again, the answer is that what Aaron Akoin did was he woke up that point deep inside of each of them that didn't want that mariva, that didn't want that fight, that wanted peace, because he knew that it's always there. There's no such thing as a Jew who betoch tocho wants sina and machlokas and hatred. It's not true. No matter how much you see on the outside, and to him that was such an emes that he was able to Bring it out. The story that I love about the original, I guess we'll finish with this story. It's always good to... There was a story about a chassid of the original who used to travel. He didn't live near where the Rebbe lived, but he used to go travel to the Rebbe sometime as chassidim do, go for a yontuv, go for a Shabbos, get chizuk. And then one year he did a very bad avera. And... He had this thing, Hasidim sometimes feel that the Rebbe's just going to look at you and know what you did. So he didn't want to go. They, they say that the, the Ger Rebbe, the Beis Yisrael, once a Bachar came to say good Shabbos to him and he'd like put his hat all the way down to his eyebrows because the Bachar would say, the Rebbe sees your Averis on your forehead. So the Rebbe said to him, if it were really true, I could see Averis on your forehead. You think I couldn't see through a hat? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> but it's, a, <laughs> yeah, you <were> sharp. <laughs> so, so, so he didn't go to the Rishner that year. Because he didn't go to the Rebbe that year, his behavior disintegrated even more. He got further and further away. The payas went, the beard went, the sitter went, the gemaras, everything went. And he lost it all. 
And he went off into life as a businessman traveling. In his travels, he comes to one town and he sees one of these big signs up, Tzadik Bola'ir, the Rishner Rebbe is coming to town. And he says, you know what, I'd really like to see the Rebbe. Just to see him, you know. And he says, I'll just go into the shul, I'll sit in the back, nobody's going to recognize me. Don't look the way I was. He comes into the shul, he looks, he sees the Rebbe. And then after Mincha, everybody lines up, they're coming to say Shalom Aleichem to the Rebbe. And he says, I just want to, I'll go say Shalom Aleichem, he's not going to recognize me. So he comes in the line, Shalom Aleichem, the handshake, but the Rebbe doesn't let go of his hand. He says, I want to tell you a story. Now he knew he was in trouble. <laughs> he said, there were once two brothers who had a terrible feud. Terrible feud, they didn't speak to each other for years. And then one of the brothers was about to make the first wedding of a child. His first daughter was getting married. And he really wanted to end the feud. He sent a letter to his brother, got it back, returned to sender. He sent the shliach to speak to his brother, brother threw him out of the house. He tried everything he could, it didn't work. Comes the day of the wedding, and he's there, and one of the musicians notices that the father of the bride looks not so happy which isn't such an uncommon occurrence at weddings, if we're honest, all right? But anyways, this looked out of, uh, out of character. He comes over to me, he says, listen, it's a big simcha today, what's wrong with you? I said, I'll tell you, I have one brother. We weren't speaking for so many years. I tried to convince him to come to the wedding. I was hoping that maybe he would come. He said, he didn't come. I said, where does your brother live? He said, he lives here in this town. He says, what's his address? He said, no, you won't be. Give me his address. So the man goes, he's a violinist. And he stands outside the brother's house and he starts playing this beautiful niggin on the violin. Now the brother had come up with a tactic. He felt himself weakening also. So in order to ensure that he wouldn't go to the wedding, he stayed up all night the night before. And then he went to sleep at four o'clock in the afternoon. So he says, by the time I wake up, the wedding will be over. But here as he's sleeping, this haunting niggin comes into his mind. And it sounds so beautiful. And he wakes up and... He has to find that niggin, and he walks downstairs, and he opens the door, and the violinist is there, and then the violinist starts walking, and he keeps following the violinist, and the violinist goes all the way till he comes to the wedding hall, and the man follows him in, and the father of the bride sees him. His brother came, he comes, he gives a hug, he says, I am so glad you came, but why are you in pajamas? <laughs> right? so, so, so the originer said, right, the originer said, he said, do you realize how long I've been trying to get you to come to me? He said, if you would have come before, now you look like you're in pajamas, you know, when you come here. He said, if you would have come before, but that was the idea. He was trying to awaken that point in him that he knew was there. It's always there. Aaron Akoin knew that in terms of feuds. We're supposed to know that in terms of every Jew. When we come, we start off, we write, Anu matirim lispali marvaryonim. Everybody says, don't look at the guys next to you. That's always what people do. You should be looking inwards. But the idea on Yom Kippur is nobody is as they seem. Everyone shines. Everyone has that nakuda which is there, which comes out to the forefront. And that's why particularly those words, which were never uttered by Yaakov Avinu, but which were an expression of a truth that never changes, are the ones that save the day when the Kohen Gadol goes in on Yom Kippur. Merci, Mathieu, de tout.